but a videotape showing you how to put it together. Now, it's not anywhere near as sophisticated as what we have or as efficient, but it'll work for you when you can spend as little as $800 or as high as $2,300 on just the parts for it, but you can build it yourself if you follow his directions. And that's where I was saying I'm a lousy electronics guy, so I had to follow his directions because if I was a good electronics guy, I would have built it my way and it wouldn't have worked. <coughs> so, <laughs> you know, there's a reason for God putting people in certain tasks. The, um, the principles of this thing, as I was saying, we're re really not too sure exactly what's happening. Everything is frequency dependent, but there's another thing that seems to happen from the device, the energy coming off of it. I know that when I'm running it, whether I'm running it on frequency or just the carrier, that if I'm in this room with it a bit, and I walked up to a touch-tone lamp, before I get to it, I can light the lamp. And the reason for it is my body is a capacitor, so it's carrying that electricity. And I think what's happening because of, of, of this capacitance of the human body is that it's actually giving us a charge, because if you go right into our cellular structure, if you, and our, right from our brain, everything is powered on electricity. And all it's doing is giving us a boost. It's like having a flat battery and getting charged up. We find that women, uh, uh, on the average, really get rejuvenated with it. Most guys that are around it for the first time want to lay on the floor and go to sleep. So there's a difference of the, <laughs> of the energy, you know? We, we know that uh, in, in the work that I've been doing, in terms of, uh, like, I, I work with a microscope, and I work with, with live blood analysis and urine analysis and saliva and all that stuff, and I dig into everything, and because I don't have a boundary on everything, I don't know where to stop, so I keep looking to the point where we're finding out more and more. And one of the discoveries that we've just made is that it has to do with cancer. We were wondering why we only had success for a certain period of time, and there was a, a difficulty that we had encountered. Somewhere between 6 and 12 weeks, the device didn't seem to work as well. And when we checked the machines out, they were just fine, because we could bring somebody fresh into it, and they would get the same results. And what was happening is that <coughs> within the body, within this acid uh, condition the, where these bugs were ac actually thriving, as we changed and killed them off, we'd also change that acid condition, which would create the bug to morph. In other words, it would change from one form to another. So here we're running one set of frequencies, and of course they've already done their job, <laughs> but another bug is coming along and replacing it. And, and the bug that we found, believe it or not, is E. coli. Six weeks ago we finally put the final pieces together of it, that's the second stage of, of cancer. And all of a sudden, you get a massive load of E. coli, <coughs> replacing the BX and the BY. And if you don't run the E. coli frequencies, you can't knock the cancer down. Now, my research is primitive on it. It's not enough people to have, have validated it. But what we have found is rife notes saying exactly that. And we didn't find it at, until the time that we started looking for it. I got it from a fellow <coughs> by the name of Audrey A. Kuhn in the United Kingdom that he's got one of Rife's notes saying that, you know, if you go from BX, it goes to E. coli. And I said, Shh, there's the light, you know, there's the connection. So with this now, we actually have a higher degree of effectiveness than we've ever had before. And I suspect that as time goes, things will get better and better and better with it as we learn to use it wiser. It's like giving somebody an excavator and a manual and having them going out and, and building a mountain road. Well, you know, the longer they're working on the equipment, the better the road gets and the faster they can do it, you know. So everything is familiarity. So <coughs> seeing as how I left my notes on the computer and didn't print them off yesterday morning, I'm sort of running out of things to say and I don't want to duplicate a whole bunch. So I'm just going to pause for a little bit and I'm actually going to go into some questions right now and maybe it'll trigger some of, the, some of these other no nodules that are in the back here. I never said it made us smarter, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Oh, excuse me. Have to go up to the microphone? Oh, yeah. Um, is it on? Is it on? Is that? Um, I have a question uh, in regards to bioresonance therapy. You heard about that? Yes, we work with bioresonance therapy as well. Yes. Yes, I ha I'm actually in treatment by someone in Kelowna. Who uh, does it? I just uh, and I'm uh, just wondering if uh, that is a similar technology to what you're talking yeah. about. Yes, it's frequency technology, and we also work with bioresonance. One of the things that we found is that when we were looking for the reasons why the device was no longer working between the six and eight weeks mark, we knew that we weren't matching up in the frequencies. So how do you find the frequencies if you don't have a microscope? 
where you can take a sample and actually sit it underneath there and destroy it. There's no microscopes that are available commercially where you can actually see a living virus at an optical level. You can see it at an enhanced le level through computer genera generation, but it's not like looking at it the same way. So we needed another way. With the no microscope being available, we went to bioresonance equipment. And we're working with a company in Germany where <coughs> we can actually take the, on the acupuncture points, the Chinese acupuncture points in your, on your hands and on your feet, and it'll actually take us and locate the organ that's overloaded, underloaded, and it'll give us an idea of the frequencies that we should use to deal with that problem. We've actually learned now that when you have cancer, that it'll actually not just address the cancer, but the causative concerns of the cancer as well, using bioresonant equipment. And we're at a point within the next 6 to 12 months where we're going to be releasing this information to the rest of the world because when you take this bioresonance equipment that does the diagnosis, it's like a diagnostic assistant. It's not to disempower the practitioner, but to affirm what's going on in the human body and things that can't be diagnosed. And you hook that equipment up with this device and have it throw the frequencies that the bioresonance is integrated in through the computer. The efficacy rate, listen to this, is 95%. And that's on our research for the last two years. This is taking cases from around the world where there's been no solution to them, working with my research assistant down in Toronto, a doctor, and he's telling me 95, 97%. This, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, <coughs> it's going to be a whole new delivery method for our health, but the difficulty we're going to have is that in, there's no money in health. Doctors can't make a living on health. The pharmaceutical companies can't make a level, living on health. They make a living on your illnesses. So what we have to do is to get the, our doctors, first of all, that's, there, there's, there's our buddies, there's our friends. We have to get them to understand that we can give them a new tool mm -hmm. so they don't have to see their patients die yeah. because they have hearts just like you and I and we have to side with them and they have to know that we're on their side. This is not to disempower them. This is to give them a better way of dealing with their patients, a better way of being a professional. Because why do they pass you on to an oncologist? Because, you know, they've given birth to you, they've, you know, your doctor's getting old, right? And he passes you on to somebody else because he d that oncologist doesn't have that same personal connection that this doctor has had with you all through your illnesses through the years. But I mean, it's how they preserve themselves. So, we'll be able to empower our doctors with a brand new method which is far better than anything, and hopefully they'll have enough courage to not be bought out by the pharmaceutical companies. I hate to be critical of pharmaceuticals because you can't, you can't live without them. There's some, certain things that these drugs can do that nothing else can do I don't, that I, I've seen. I've seen some really wonderful things happen with the drugs. But <clears throat> the, the way the whole system is working, it's in the United States they spend $13,000 a year on each medical doctor is the budget from the pharmaceutical company to entertain that one doctor. That's with its free samples, that's with the presentations, that's the courses, that's the freebies. In Canada, it's $11,000. First of all, it should be illegal that they even do that. It's like me uh, selling this equipment and then spending thousands of dollars with the practitioners so they'll sell it to each one of their patients. You understand what I'm saying? It's just a way of making money and it has nothing to do with the goodness of society. It has to do with making bucks. So, question? Uh, a two-part question here. Um, what uh, relationship does Rife have to the um, studies by uh, uh, Dr. Hilda Clark? Because I have a, I have a, what, call it, what they call a zapper, mm -hmm. which is a single frequency, which has seemed to be quite beneficial. Yes. And I know that Rife was much more sophisticated than that. Yep. And um <coughs> what, um, what I wanted to also ask is that the second part of the question is, uh, I, you understand, I understand that you said there's a, uh, you're waiting for uh, approvals for the, the equipment in yeah, Canada. Yeah, so we've applied, yes. You've applied for it, okay. Yes, yeah. Whether you get the approval or not is a different thing. That's right. Um, the second part is that uh, can this equipment be sold as uh, non-medical equipment or in parts or as a waiver saying that you understand this is a novelty and not a medical device? Yeah, we could, you know, but it's sort of bending the, the rule of the law, you know. Um, Let's start, start with the relationship between Rife and Clark first. Halder Clark is uh, 
is actually a Canadian scientist working in the United States. She's a doctor, written some really excellent books. I agree with her on a lot of wonderful things, but there's a lot of things I disagree with her on. But essentially, she uses a delivery method of a frequency, which is what Rife was talking about. So it's a Rife technique. But it's where the question is really good is the clarification of the two technologies. You said it was different. You have to recognize when people talk about Rife, there are apples and there are oranges, OK? That's the orange, <coughs> and then there's the apples, which are the contact type devices. This device does not contact your body. You stay at least six feet away from it, and if I ran it here, if I ran it here today, it would do every one of you simultaneously. And the only ones that will be affected by it are the ones that need it. We validated that. Nothing happens to you if there's nothing wrong, and we have to re drive that thing like a car responsibly. For example, if I ran the single frequency of herpes simplex 1 and 2, those of you that have that virus will be affected by it, and you will have a noticeable difference. The rest of you, nothing happens. Nothing happens. So when we're talking about the two technologies, when you have a contact-type device that works with a single individual, and it has its wonderful benefits because it puts you in direct contact with your practitioner who's working with you, and you have this wonderful interaction. There's less interaction with this particular device that I have here, because if a practitioner has it, he probably has a technician as well, and he prescribes a set of frequencies or whatever it is. You go see the technician, they run the device for them, and that's probably the way it's going to go, so it's a little bit of a difference that way. But the difference is, is that on a contact-type device, it uses electricity for the delivery of the frequency. Electricity follows the path of least resistance, so it means it can miss something in there. The plasma device can't miss anything. It'll get everything from your hair to your toenails. It misses nothing. It can't miss anything. You can put a table between you, a piece of lead around you, and it'll still penetrate through that. We know that. The only thing that holds the signal back is aluminum. It does not penetrate aluminum. Yeah. There's things in science that can't describe that signal. We've had it on the best oscilloscopes in the world. We've had it on the best spectro <coughs> analyzers of light. And they cannot tell us exactly what is coming off of this device that's creating this effect. You can put that device in a Faraday cage and hold all, contain all the RF. And yet, on the outside of that cage, you can still get the healing benefits from it. The advantage of the plasma device is going to show up one day. We've talked about pretty soon there's going to be a great earthquake, or in a thousand years you're going to get hit by an asteroid and there's going to be a major calamity on the planet, right? Well, the other thing that gets talked about is that there's going to be a pande pandemic one day. You know what a pandemic is? No. Okay. In the, um, back in Europe, what, 1300s, we had the plague. That was an epidemic. It was an area that was fairly well contained, knocked one-third of the population out. Well, a pandemic's greater than that. It's worldwide. And when a pandemic takes off, because of the transport today, you know, an aircraft can leave Great Britain, land in Montreal, people spread out, end up in Chicago, Florida, and all that. And this bug that is going to go around, it's going to be contagious, will be spread in just a matter of 72 to 96 hours. And there's so many bugs out there today, that there's no cure for it. The hantavirus, let's talk about it. There's no cure for the hantavirus. The, the hantavirus, H-A-N-T-A. This comes from the North American deer mouse, very prominent in, in the southwest United States. You walk into a room that's old and dusty, and you inhale that dust. The virus goes active. Average person dies in 32 hours. Nine out of 10 die. Okay. Well, the hantavirus, just so that you know, went contagious for the first time in history a few years ago in one of the Pacific Rim com countries over there. I think it was China or Taiwan or something like that. And I read a short report on it, and it was scary, because if the hantavirus ever goes here and there's no cure for it, what the hell are you going to do? Well, there you are. We still need to do the research on the hantavirus, but it's easy to do because they've got it in control studies. We can, in fact, I went down to the States last winter and I was going to do it. I didn't do it. I got involved in other things. But if we had 500 people and we put them into an auditorium, set the equipment up so it transmits that frequency for the hantavirus, every hour we can put 500 people through and 7 out of 10 will live. 
rather than nine out of 10 dying. So what happens if it's another type of virus? It's the same thing, because by the time they get a little you know, shot that's going to fix you up, it's all over. It's gonna happen that fast. That's why that technology that we're working with has to be protected. It's not just the fact that it, you know, it can do 500 people, but if you want, if you want mankind to get, have a better chance of survivability, that's what's going to do it. And that's where it's important for you people to understand what it can do and also understand its limitations. And by talking to your doctors and practitioners, eventually you're going to introduce this to them and they're going to understand it. The first time you talk to them, what I mean, they may turn their heads up, their eyes up in their head and say, God, that sounds so easy, so this is, must be a real silly, fictitious story. But what I'm telling you is absolutely the truth. We've seen under the microscope it killing bugs. They don't, doesn't kill them just like, like shooting them with a gun. You run the frequencies and you go back 30, 40 minutes later and the bugs are all dead. That's what we see. And when you leave your samples over like by the microscope like I've done, it kills your samples too. That's even when the machine's running from over there. We've done this time after time again. In fact, if you go onto Dr. Bear's website, he can show you a paramecium blowing up when he's running the machine. So what we're talking about is not science fiction, it is here today. This is stuff that we have that's cheap, effective, and what we need is people trained to use it properly. Because without training, you're never going to reap the full benefits of what the technology can do. Next question. Yeah, we were talking last night about the work that I've been doing with the Common Cause Medical Research Foundation in regards to the mycoplasma, the mycoplasma fermentans that was patented by the military and that is pro the probable common source for all neurodegenerative diseases. My question is, <coughs> this Rife system, do you actually have the frequency? Do you feel that you're hitting this mycoplasma? Or can we work together, maybe? <laughs> this is a, an area that's going to have to be researched because the mycoplasma that I look under my microscope, every one of them is slightly different. They're, it looks like a cyst, mm -hmm. threads coming off of it. Each one of the patterns is different. When a pattern is different on something, it'll also change the frequency, frequency. but it, they may have zones of frequencies from here to here that will hit it. We haven't done that. And the reason we haven't done it, it's just me who's doing this research well, in my particular instance. I can appreciate how yeah. you, it's just like me running. <laughs> yeah. It's like you're a lone ranger out there, so maybe we can connect somehow and, and get the same researchers and try to get that uh, experiment done. Well, w w what I'd like to have happen is that somewhere in the pot, government put some damn money in it. You know, government has not put one penny in it. We've invited them to our conferences. We've invited to show them. I've invited myself down to show them. They don't even want to listen to it. Certainly don't want to put money in it. You know, give you an, here's an example. You, you just wonder about the sanity of mankind. We're talking about the pine beetle, you know, eating all these trees up, like four billion dollars a year worth of timber, right? Well, we have a, an old fellow who uses this device for his own cancer, and he's working up in Prince George, and he's getting these beetles from forestry friends, and he can run frequencies for them, and he finds them dead within 24 hours. And what we're trying to do is establish that the device, when you boost the power up, that you can run them out there, so we don't have to poison dick all in the environment. We just get rid of the bugs, right? Think government will put 10 cents in a pot and take a chance on it? Don't you think there's something wrong out there? And we vote these people in. You know, this is why I say, you guys are the power. You don't have to put up with this stuff anymore, you know? There's a different way of doing things. Remember when doctors didn't wash their hands before surgery? Do you remember when doctors were saying acupunctures were quacks, chiropractors were quacks? Things change, and our doctors have to be changed. Our educational system is this really bad. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Rose. <laughs> Another question. Um, 